I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the, the destiny, destiny of, of democracy. democracy. I urge every American of all religions and of all colors from every section of this country to join me in that cause. At times, history and fate meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. Long-suffering men and women peacefully protested the denial of their rights as Americans. For the cries of pain and the hymns and protest of oppressed people have summoned into convocation all the majesty of this great government. In our time, we have come to live with moments of great crisis. Our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country. To right wrong, to do justice, to serve man. There is no southern problem. There is no northern problem. There is only an American problem. We are met here as Americans to solve that problem. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO of the LBJ Foundation, Mark K. Updegrove. Good evening. And welcome to the closing event to the Summit on Race in America. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Five years ago today, we concluded the Civil Rights Summit, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the first of many advances on civil rights made during the presidency of Lyndon Baines Johnson. On that occasion, President Barack Obama stood on this stage and sounded a warning. History travels not only forward, he said, history can travel backwards. History can travel sideways. It is our hope that this summit in some way helped to push us forward on the pressing issue of race in our nation, just as President Johnson would have wanted us to do. The LBJ Foundation has many people, institutions, foundations, and corporations to thank for the last few days. Thanks to our sponsors who gave generously to make this happen. Thanks to our partners at the University of Texas and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Thanks to our outstanding participants. Thanks to all of our volunteers who gave generously of their time to help us stage this. Thanks to our vendors. And finally, thanks to the staffs of the LBJ Foundation and the LBJ Library. Will you please join me in giving all those folks a hand? Thank you. And now, to finish us out, we're going to take you from Austin to Motown in conjunction with our brand new exhibit, Motown, 60 Years of Hitsville, USA. And here to moderate our panel of Motown All-Stars is the founding director of the Grammy Museum, our partner, and our friend, Bob Santelli. Thank you and good evening. You might say we've saved the best for last, but that's not true. It's also not fair. I think if you were here for the past three days, you would agree with me that every panelist, every person who graced this stage was truly exceptional, truly awe-inspiring, and just something that happened today that in your minds and mine, and hopefully the nation's, we made a little history. Wouldn't you agree? Now, as Mark said, um, the reason why we're here and we are the last panel is because 
very soon, this Saturday, we will open up uh, our latest exhibit, the partnership with the LBJ Library <clears throat> and Presidential Museum. And this, of course, is about Motown. It's a 60-year retrospective because this year we celebrate 60 years since that incredible American record company began. And so tonight, we have some very, very special guests. And I think what you're going to do is, if you've been a Motown fan, you're going to hear stories that you've never heard before. And if you're new to Motown, you're going to walk out of here a fan of Motown. So let me introduce you to my guests. None other than Barry Gordy proclaimed her the first lady of Motown. She was a member of the Miracles, who along with Smokey Robinson and other group members, made Motown history by being the first group signed by Mr. Gordy all the way back in 1957. Her grace and her style goes without saying. Please welcome to the stage, Ms. Claudette Robinson. Think about absolute soul and some of the very best harmonies of not just the 1960s, but of any decade. I'm talking about none other than the four tops. That means Bernadette, Sugar Pie, Honey Bunch, and my all-time favorite, Baby, I Need Your Loving. Please welcome to the stage founding member of the Four Tops, Mr. Duke Fakir. that to stop that was good <laughs> all right now the Supremes were the greatest of all girl groups who can forget baby love you can't hurry love stop in the name of love and so many more in fact at one point they had five consecutive number one singles rivaling the Beatles in the height of Beatlemania Please welcome to the stage one of the founding members of the Supremes, Miss Mary Wilson. Please have a seat. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good start, what not you say? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yes, but you know what? I didn't get a chance to sing all my background parts. I know, you know, I know. You know, like the oohs and the ahs and the baby, baby, babies. <laughs> that's the next panel. But don't be laughing because no. I was laughing all the way to the bank for about all 55 right. years. <laughs> 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 Okay. Well, there's, there's so much to talk about because there's so much history that Motown made and continues to make right up until today. So I want to go back in time and I want to ask the question because a lot of people ask this question of me as a music historian and probably of you too. It's the 1950s, the late 1950s, and it's Detroit. And in Detroit, we have a lot of talent, obviously, because... Barry Gordy, who will ultimately sign all of it and take it out of Detroit into not just America, but the entire world. My question is, was this unique to Detroit? 
Or was it where you could go into any black neighborhood in the inner cities anywhere in America and find the same kind of talent? What do you think, Duke? Let's well, start with you. Well, actually, you could find that yeah. kind of talent in all of the, any and all of these cities. But what they didn't have in most of the cities was a Barry Gordy ah, with the right. vision. And he, he built little by little by mm -hmm. a wonderful little seed that he had planted in the ground and built it into a global flower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, you need somebody to cultivate all the talent out of the cities. Cause I, that, that's a guy that right, lived right next to me, saying me under the table, but, but he wasn't as fortunate. He wasn't yeah. as blessed or maybe he didn't quite know how, mm -hmm. but the talent was definitely there. And in all the cities is still there. Yeah. Yes. Right. You know, because in, 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 in uh, New York City, you had Frankie Lyman and the teenagers and That's they true. lived in the projects. Right. So you, do, you did have talent everywhere. Yeah. But as Duke said, it was uh, Barry Gordy with his, uh, his dare to dream uh, thing. And we all, you know, we all kind of went to Motown. So we had a place to go. So I think that that's the difference. Yeah. We had a place yeah. to go. Yeah. He had that vision. He could mm -hmm. articulate that vision and he, and he yeah. carried it out. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why he carried it out really goes back to the miracles and, and all the way back, as I said in my introduction to 1957, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of Motown, 1959, but your relationship with Barry Gordy goes back to 1957. How did that happen? How did you meet Barry Gordy? Well, actually we met Mr. Gordy uh, in 1957, we had gone on an audition uh, with, I went with the four guys. My brother originally had been a member of the group. The group at that time was called the Matadors. I had a sister group called the Matadorettes. Uh, <laughs> prior to that, my brother had a group called the Orchids and I had a group called the Orchids. <laughs> But to tell you, uh, when we went to audition, the gentleman that we went to see, we were at uh, Jackie Wilson's recording studio. And um, as we got there, we did our audition. We sang like five original songs. And the gentleman said, the world does not need another group that has a girl in the background. Because you know, they always wanted the girl to be the lead yeah. singer, not to just be in the background. Well, I had no desire to be the lead singer because Smokey was the lead singer and he sang very well. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so the guys were very disappointed and there was a gentleman walking around and he came over and said, how many songs do you have? And Smokey, of course, said a hundred and he asked to listen to them. And we did, we auditioned for um, the gentleman. Of course, we did not know who he was, at least I didn't know. And he said, my name is Barry Gordy. Well, I know today when you say the name Barry Gordy, you know, everyone knows who he is and his accomplishments and achievements. But at that time, he was a songwriter and I actually didn't know of the name. And so when it was finished, he said, I'd like to work with you guys. And he said, I'm, you know, Barry Gordy. And I was thinking, Smokey was so excited, like Barry Gordy, Barry Gordy. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who was that? Well, you know, there was a magazine at that time. It was called Hit Parade. And Hit Parade would include the name of the song as well as the lyrics. lyrics. And on top of the lyrics would be the songwriter or writers. And Smokey always, I guess they said he started writing songs at six years old. And so he knew Mr. Gordy's name. He, he wanted so much to just get into this business. And Mr. Gordy, when he said that he wanted to work with us, that's what we did. We started working with him. We didn't have a name. Mr. Gordy said we need to have a um, name that would suit a group that had a girl in it because Matadors wasn't going to quite make it. <laughs> so, we all put names in a hat, uh, really a hat. And so the person that pulled the name out of the hat was me. And that name became The Miracles. Yeah. And that's how Yay. we became The Miracles. <laughs> the Miracles. <laughs> now, Duke, even though this is 1957, your, your group has been around a while already. Yeah, so we, take we it back. We actually started in 1954. Wow. Uh, and we started with a different name than the Tops. We started 
as the four aims, because uh, we didn't want our name to be anything other than to tell, to show people that we were aiming, shooting for the stars, and that we were trying to climb those ladders, you know. But when we had our first recording uh, contract, which was in 1956, with Chess Records, the four Ames brothers were very popular at that time. And they were a white group. Uh, so I told uh, Phil Chess, I said, look, man, people gonna know the difference. It don't matter. Don't, we don't need to change the name shit. <laughs> but he said, no, we have to change the name. So our musical director, his name was, uh, anyway, our musical director. <laughs> Lost the history. His name was Maurice King. He asked the question, well, how do you, how do you come with the, the four aims? I said, well, we were shooting for the stars. We were trying to get to the moon. We want to be on top of the show business. We want he says, what about the four tops? Everybody looked at each other, feeling them, shaking their head. We all said, okay, let's go. <laughs> and that's how we got the name, the four tops. Mm -hmm. Now, the Supremes also have a, a backstory in terms of a name as well. You didn't start out as the Supremes, right? No, and I actually should tell you as well that it was Eddie Kendricks and Paul Williams uh, who, of the which, they, uh, they became the Temptations, oh, but yeah. they were originally the Primes. The Primes. And yeah. so when we, when we went to audition for them, they gave us the name of Primettes. And as, as Claudette was saying, <laughs> back in those days, you had to say if you were a girl or a guy. And so this way everyone knew if you had an X et, or a rail or whatever, you were a girl. <laughs> And so that's how we, we got our name because we, we were named after the primes. Yeah. And uh, it was amazing because when we went to Motown to sign our first contract, and this, when we started, we were only 13, 14 years old, okay? okay. So but by the time we got to Motown, uh, it was, I think, around 1960 or 61. So we wanted to sign our contract. And Mr. Gordy said, okay, you can, we, you can sign your contract. However, you got to change that name. I don't like that name. Well, are there any lawyers out there? Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing. We, at 16, we did not read our contract. Okay. We were like thrilled to be there. We would have signed. We, I, I would have given away one of my 11 grandchildren for, to be at Motown. Okay. That's how much we wanted to yeah. go there. We didn't care about money. We just wanted to be there. And so Mr. Gordy said, said to us, okay, sign the contract. And uh, we, he said, did you ch get a new name? And we said, uh, oh, do we really have to change our name from the primaries? He said, oh, yeah. So uh, Florence Ballard was almost like Claudette, uh, was the one who pulled the name out of, uh, of, of a bag, a brown paper bag or whatever. And it was the Supremes. Well, Diane and I and Barbara Martin, who was in the group, because we were four at the time, did not like the Supremes because it sounded like a building. You know, we're, we're girls, we're girly girls, right? And so, uh, but Mr. Gordy said, oh, well, you gotta have a new name. So Florence says, well, I call it the Supreme. So Florence was the one who, who named wow. our group. And but I, the, about the lawyer bit, let me tell you why, then I get off this, I have to do this. I write books and I write the real stories, you see, so people, anyway, here we go. Uh, so, <laughs> we, did, we did not read the small print at the bottom of the contract that said, and any new name you would, get, any fictitious name you'll get, uh, we, the Motown, own that name. So they ended up owning the name Supremes, which we really didn't know until like years later that we did not own our own name. So I regret that. Yeah. Any lawyers who want to take on my case? No. <laughs> One thing I'd like the audience to remember, this was in the 50s, folks. Yes, it was. That was another world yes. altogether. A lot of you can't even imagine what it was like back then. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's not the big, busy show business that it was. You know, it was black and white TV. It was all kind of things yeah. that you maybe, a lot, a lot of you don't even know about. So just kind of put yourself back in the mindset of when mm -hmm. we started, which yeah. is all back in the 50s. Another yeah. world completely. And all right. we wanted to do was sing. And we want, we, you know, today everyone wants to get into the business because they want to be stars and everybody thinks that they're stars, right? Back then we were, we were like black kids. We just wanted to sing, right? And, and, and it was amazing because I would have done anything to be at Motown. They didn't have to pay me anything, you know? I didn't want, any, I just wanted to be up there and sing. Yeah, so it was definitely a different world and we did not read the contracts. The contracts were really horrible, I gotta say, you know? <laughs> you didn't have lawyers back then? We didn't have no. We didn't, you have a manager? We couldn't afford a lawyer yeah. back then. We lived in the projects, you know? We couldn't afford a lawyer. They didn't know about that. Yeah. Mr. Gordy was the manager. Perfect. He was our manager for the miracle. Yeah, 
All right. So well, we didn't know anything about that. Thing that was really <laughs> special about the relationship. Most and you had relationships prior to Gordy yeah. uh, and Motown with other record companies. Yes, okay, did. you guys did. And here's the thing: this was a black-owned, mm -hmm. family-owned record company right. based out of Detroit, not New York, not LA, not mm -hmm. Chicago. So there was some yes. connection there. There must have been some element of trust going in yes. because. He was homegrown, just like you guys well, were. And, and most of it was, they, like she said, it's the desire to sing. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, mm -hmm. you all want to sing. Mm -hmm. Even when we joined, we just wanted to sing, but we had a little more knowledge about contracts because we had been with, th with three other companies and they didn't know how to record the Four Tops because we, you, we sang like on the fence. We could sing pop stuff. We could sing uh, all the... Uh, all the old songs that people would sing, that which are called the standards, and right. we could sing country, we could sing anything. We were very fortunate, but that kept us working, you know, in different places. But it wasn't good for a recording company; right. they didn't know how to how to uh, record us. So the three companies we were with, which was Chess Records in '56, Columbia, we uh, we and Aretha went to Columbia at the same time. She went on and made it; we didn't. And we did uh, recorded at Riverside. Nothing. It took Motown to. We knew everything about the stage, but nothing about recording. Mm. And that's what we learned at Motown. Yeah. You tell a great story about actually getting the contract from Barry Gordy. Why don't you tell that story? Yeah. Well, we were in New York recording, and we were working up in the Catskill Mountain, and one of the uh, executives from NBC saw us and say, look, I want you on my Tonight Show. So uh, we went on Tonight Show. Steve Allen was the host at that time. Mm -hmm. And we sung this old standard written by uh, Cole Porter, In the Steel of the Night. A lot of you have heard it and know it. Mm -hmm. Barry Gordy saw that and saw us on TV, and he had his uh, A&R director with him. He said, wow, I love them boys. He said, I'd like to get them on my label. He said, I know they're from Detroit but I don't know him. He said, Mickey, do you know him? He said, yeah, I've been knowing him. He said, can you get in touch with him and bring him to Detroit? He said, yeah. So Mickey got in touch with us. And at that time, it just, it just thrilled us for a couple of reasons. Because we had been around this country looking for the right recording. And all we had to do was walk down the street. You know, <laughs> shit. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy, but you know, so when he called us, we were excited for two reasons. We had also, while we were in New York, uh, went to the Apollo the night before, and we saw the Motown Review, the, one of the first Motown Reviews, and we said, shit, we can, we can be on that, man. We can tear that show up, man. And we actually said, we actually belong on that show, man. And then we got this call to come back to Detroit to uh, sign up with Barry Gordy. Extremely happy. We rushed back to Detroit. As I remember walking up the Hitsville steps, man, I looked at, I said, I think we're getting ready to get a piece of heaven. <laughs> yeah. So we went in and we talked for a few minutes. Then he says, well, I want to sign you guys. He says, here's my contract. So we looked at it. We said, mm, well, uh, we're going to take it home, Barry. We, we, we'll bring it back uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. He said, hold, hold it, hold it. So you don't take my contract out. You have to sign it right here on the spot. I said, Barry, we can't do that. You know, we, we've been with three record companies and we know you have to look at all these different things on the contract to see if, you know, if there's anything in your favor, <laughs> you know, it ain't gonna be a whole lot. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and the one word that I, as I glanced through it, I didn't see was the word advance, which record companies then, if, you know, if they liked you to give you a little advance, wasn't much, but it was something, you know, uh, to show that good faith, to show that they, they liked you. And, was ready to record you. So we did, I didn't see that word. So we kept talking, we said, look, we have to take it home. Uh, he, we convinced him, he says, okay, but bring it back in the morning. Well, we took it home and we all talked. Now we knew we gonna sign no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah. So we, we talked about it. We said, you know, well, well what's the bad side? What if, what if he won't give us the van? I said, well, we'll figure out some way to sign it. Don't worry about it. So we went back to the office we gave him the contract and we said, Barry, there's one thing in there we didn't see, and that's about the advance. He said, advance? He said, I don't give any advances. 
So we need to work the whole, just, you know, in advance, all record companies do some amount of money. He said, I just don't do that, fellas. So we kept looking at each other. And we kept talking about the event. Said, well, I don't see how we can find it, Barry. You know, we, I'm just talking shit now. You know, I'm just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so he, we kept talking, kept talking. We was holding our head down, everybody looking sad. We are good actors. <laughs> <laughs> and so he finally said, okay, fellas. All right, here's what I can do. He reached in his pocket. He pulled out a few hundreds. He said, here's $400, 100 for you, 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 and you. I said, give me the pen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So did the miracles get a hundred dollars? Did uh, the no, Springs? Actually, we didn't. No. We didn't get any advance. Yeah. The, other thing, the other thing was is that when we started with Mr. Gordy, there was no Motown, there was no Gordy, there was no Tamil, there was no label yet. Mm. Uh, the label didn't actually start until January twelfth, nineteen fifty nine, and we had started with Mr. Gordy being our manager and. Uh, road manager, agent, whatever it might be. <laughs> and it was, um, uh, we also, we probably were one of the few acts that actually, we the Miracles, um, we actually gave him 10% of our income whenever we had an income. Because recording at that time, there was only like two tracks. You know, unlike uh, now you might have 48, yeah, 60, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. We had two tracks, which meant that uh, as we became the Miracles, which I'll tell you that in a little bit, because we were still the Matadors, um, what would happen is we'd go into the recording studio and Mr. Gordy actually many times had to pawn his suits so that he would have enough money to uh, record us. Because unbeknownst to a lot of people, he was not a rich guy. He was just an ordinary guy that was trying, really trying to make that dream and vision come true for himself as well as for others. And so when it was time to record, he didn't have the money, so he would take his suits, take them to the pawn shop and get X amount of dollars. And we'd go into the studio, which was not Motown or Hitsville yet. And what would happen is sometimes it took all day long to record one song because with only two tracks if the group messed up then you had to start all over yep. and if the band messed up you had to start all over yeah. so even just one mistake was one too many because it was just really difficult and when I think so we did not have auto-tune like people have today that's some of it written into their contracts you know we didn't know anything about that we knew that you had to sing on key and harmonize and have a blend and if you didn't have that you had to try again so it was um, I can tell you that each and every one of the Motown acts um, all of them had to be able to sing. And we, when we finally became the Miracles, um, it, if we had not been able to sing, Mr. Gordy actually never would have signed us on in the first place. Because yeah. mm -hmm. he really believed that you should have talent, you know, and not yeah. just be somebody that went to the shower or something and just <laughs> thought you're great. Because today, many of the artists, you know, they're beautiful or handsome or whatever, and that's what a lot of the companies go on is their looks rather than their talent even though i must tell you that there are many many talented people out there today so i'm not trying to undermine the great talents of today because i enjoy them very much many of them yeah. if let's put it this way on the outside looking in it seemed like the supremes just came and just exploded on the scene. Not true. Not true, right. <laughs> you, the, the group actually had a nickname at Motown, didn't it? Well, no, but I, I gave them the nickname. You gave them the nickname. I, let me tell you a little bit yeah. about uh, how yeah. we started singing, okay? We're the primates now, and we would do a lot of record hops. I, uh, how many people out there old enough, you remember record hops, you know? The DJs would play the record, you, okay. So we would go there, and we would sing, uh, you know, we would do our little few little songs, and and our guitarist, Marvin 
tarplin would play the guitar and so we you know we do all these kind of shows but pretty soon we were working on, on these record hops with other artists who were recording and we looked at each other we said wow maybe we should do that maybe we should record now we're about 15 years old now and uh, so we were, we heard the miracles on, on on the radio get a job and all those kind of things got a job what it and uh, we said Diane said well, you know what I know I know Smokey from another neighborhood maybe we can call him up and see if he can you know get us an audition and so we did we went to Claudette's house and all the miracles were there it was Bobby Rogers Ronnie White uh, Pete Moore and of course Smokey and Claudette and so we're up there singing our little songs uh, Florence said you know the night time is the right time it, and yeah you know <laughs> and, then, and, that, and Diane was saying there goes my baby and I kind of I kind of sang all the ballads I'm still a ballad singer but anyway so uh, after we finished singing uh, Smokey got, looked down at our guitarist Marvin Tarpon and he said Hey man, he said, do you sound good? Can you hit this note? So can you play this? So, so Marvin started playing it. And then he says, we gotta, we're going out on a date next week. Can you go with us? <laughs> <laughs> I love to tell this because Claudette, she just, she just, she's like, yeah. They stole our guitars, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but but the beautiful part about it is that Marvin went on to write many of, of, of the, he co-wrote many of the songs that the Miracles did. And so it was really wonderful. However, out of that, we did get an audition with Barry Gordy. Now, here's my other story about that. So we go to Motown now. We got this audition with the, you know, up there we were, matching skirts and the whole thing. We were still four girls, too, by the way. Barbara Martin was with us. And so we, got, we auditioned. We sang those songs. So I'm, you know the nighttime, you know, and there goes my baby. We did all the songs. And Mr. Gordy looked at us, and he looked at us. He says, well, you know what? Maybe you girls should come back and see me after you graduate from high school. <laughs> we were so disappointed because, you know, we really, I mean, we really felt we were good. We knew we were good. Let's put it that way. Uh, and so we decided, okay, so we went out the door. And I remember Florence said as we were walking out, said, hmm, you can't be that great if they don't know how good we are. <laughs> now, we... <laughs> We're not, we're not even 16 years old yet, okay? And so what we did, we went to another company, Lupine Records, and we recorded with Wilson Pickett. We did, we background for the Falcons and all that stuff. And then we said, you know what? But it's not like that Motown. That Motown was really, you know, they look like they are really doing something good. So we went back to Motown. We sat outside on the lawn. And, and if, if Marvin Gaye came by, we said, hey, Marvin, how you doing? <laughs> oh, God, I'm hey, God, I'm <laughs> You know, Mary Wells, ooh, Mark Johnson. So we were just like four girls just acting like teenage girls. And pretty soon someone came out of, of the um, Hitsville and they said, a pro producer said, our hand clappers are not here. We need some hand cla clappers. We said, we'll do it. That's how we got into Motown. So we got, to, look, just a little bit more of this story. So we got into Motown, <laughs> we got into Motown and we were like, ooh, we were like, ooh, we're here, you know. And, um, and then one day Mr. Gordon said, you know, you girls seem like you're really serious. I think I'm gonna sign you to the company. And that's when we went in and got that yeah. horrible, that fake contract. <laughs> did I really say that? Yes, I did. <laughs> but that's how we got into Motown. So they didn't find us, we found them. That. <laughs> there you go. Studio A. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's no hand class because, see, I, I've written uh, three or four books, you know, and so it's all in there. If you want to hear the story, read that. That's a real story. <laughs> <laughs> Studio A. <laughs> the studio where all of this happened. Describe for us what was it like there? Well, the first time there, was, it was like walking in, in, in our eyes, walking into a little bit of heaven, like I yeah. thought. Uh, we were so excited uh, because Holland Dozier and Holland had, had bought us a song that they said was going to be a hit. And we was working at a nightclub that night. And he just, it was raw. He played it on the piano and he could half sing it. He wasn't a great singer, but a great producer. He said, but I want you to come to the studio and record it tonight. The name of it was Baby, I Need Your Loving, by the way. Ooh, I love that so song. we went to the studio and and we, we said, look, let's do the background first. So they had the little rhythm there and they had played the song. And we did the background. We, we caught them very quick. And in about 
me in 15, 20 minutes. We were through with the background. Mm -hmm. So he went up into the engineering booth and Levi and Eddie Holland was sitting there with singing the melody and writing words. Now I saw this piece of paper that with the words were printed out already. I said, hey Lee. I said, don't you see that, that paper is already printed out? He said, well, I can't sing it until I write the words. I got to feel each word. And he did that for the rest wow. of his career. Mm -hmm. On every song, he would write out the words when he mm -hmm. could feel it. After he got through writing it out and playing around with Eddie with the melody, he went down and into the studio. And in 15 minutes again, boop, done. he had done it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sung his heart out. Yeah. You know, he's one of the greatest singers, Levi Stubbs. I, I, I think amazing. so. And, and you know, mm -hmm. I'm happy he stayed with the group. This is one thing. A lot of times the lead singer, you know, they become very big and they would leave the group and become a soloist. And the one thing about Levi Stubbs, he always stayed with his yeah. group the four times. And he was tempted. He was tempted by I'm him. sure. Didn't, he, didn't it, he do the one about the, 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 the voice of the frog or the... Oh no! Yeah, he did a little shop of horrors. Shop of horrors. Yeah. But yeah, that was after, and he acted. He came to us and asked, "Can I do that?" I said, "Man, go on that. It's yeah. gonna help us all." <laughs> right, uh, right, right. <laughs> shit. Yeah. Uh, he was off. He also was off of the part that Billy D. Williams played. Okay. In mm -hmm. uh, is it Birth of the Blues. Ladies sing the blues. No, Lady, no, 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 ladies. Ladies, 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 ladies sing the blues. Okay. Yeah. He was off. Uh -huh. That was part was written for him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, Barry Gordy sent for him and his wife, and they sat down and was talking about the part, and Levi was all excited. He said, hey, wait, 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 Barry. He said, what about the rest of the time? Okay. You got a part in the movie? He said, no, this is just for you. Yeah. He was yeah. Yeah. And walked okay. out the door. Wow. Yeah. And you know, but that, that was the only thing that we ever, that he ever was, you know, Tim bad Tim about Barry. Barry Gordy with us mm has -hmm. been like a hero. Yeah. And I'm not talking about them, I'm just talking about a particular yeah. instance. Yeah. Wow. yeah, you know, people are not aware of how uh, other people come at the groups and they're sort of, they just try to divide you. Yeah. Maybe not divide you, but what I mean is they say, hey, you know, you're really good and, or do you that and yeah. the guys are nothing. And, and that's what I really, really liked about Levi is that yeah. he never, yeah, he, he always thought about the player. group. But people are always trying to get yeah. you yes, to, to yeah, separate. For Levi, Levi was one of those singers. He yes. could actually sing yes. Yes. the telephone directory yes. and make it sound You're like right. a hit. He could he sing, sing anything. anything. He was just he amazing. Make you feel it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Every Absolutely. single word. You know, well, I, can I tell you about yeah. this about a little guy who came to Motown, Barry Gordy? We, the Supremes, would follow Barry Gordy around the entire place. We're like just behind him every day. So one day he says, girls, I got this little guy coming here and, and I'm told that he's a genius. And so we're just, just 16 and a half years old at this point, right? And so we're like, okay, we'll, we'll stick here. And here comes this little guy. <laughs> right? And so we're in the Studio A. Yeah. We go there, we, and, and, and so Stevie jumps up on the, the, the organ. We had a huge, one of a beautiful old organ there. He jumped, he started playing that. <laughs> and he jumped on the drums, whatever the drums are. Yeah, he him. played every instrument there, and we were like, oh, that's what a genius is. <laughs> <laughs> I had never seen one before, so I didn't know, you know. <laughs> Speaking of geniuses, we can't go any more in a conversation without talking about Smokey Robinson, of course. Because it wasn't just Barry Gordy. If there was an unsung hero mm -hmm. in the whole story of Motown, it was Smokey. Um, people don't realize, uh, yeah. as you can explain, that he was more than just a member of the Miracles. Uh, he did so much more. Explain. Well, Smokey had that God-given talent from the beginning. I met Smokey when he was 14 and he had already written, I don't know how many songs he had written like a play yeah. for his uh, elementary school, for his first grade class. <laughs> and so he was always in geared toward yeah. show business some sort of way and his writing abil abilities is really uncanny because he has such an easy time of writing, even though some songs would take five years and some would take five minutes. And the love of the entertainment business and the music is something that, I mean, it's hard to really believe that a person has all that talent just all inside of them because I felt like I was really talented but nowhere near <laughs> what he could do. And he loves it. I mean, he's still performing today. 
And he performs more today than he did yeah. when he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And he loves his crowd, he loves the people, and he just, I, I'm gonna say, out of all the people that I've known in my lifetime, he really is geared towards that, if you wanna put genius, that name would probably be genius in the, in, uh, the dictionary, and on the side of that would be the name Smokey Robinson. That's right. Here, here. Yeah. He's so. he amazing. Really. Oh, you know? Yeah. I only wish I could do that. Yeah. But uh, you never know. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's still time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, can yeah. we talk about another genius? Yeah. First of all, I want to say how many geniuses we had at yeah. Motown Record. I mean, I, for me, if you can name uh, Marvin Gaye. Mm. Do okay? it. Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye was just uh, given a, a stamp, his own stamp, for the United States Post Office. Yeah, that's right. And I was yeah. telling you about that. Yeah. So you can go out and, you know, get this. But, Mar and not, this is just one something that's really wonderful, but Marvin also, his song, What's Going On. Yeah. We spoke about that earlier, yeah, right? Yeah, did. did. Here's a song that probably was a, a thought or the thoughts that most of us had about what's happening in this world on this earth you know those kind of if you're mature enough when i was younger maybe i didn't but now that i'm 75 years old i, I think about things that are very important to humanity and when you think that about the people that we had at motown like a stevie wonder like a marvin gay who created, and like a Smokey Robinson, who created Holland Knows Your Holland, you know, who wrote all of our 12 number one records. Yep. All of these great, uh, Norman Whitfield, you mentioned Mickey Stevenson. Yeah. Yeah. There was so many talented people there. Mm -hmm. uh, and at 16, when we get that, when we got there, I mean, it was just amazing. I was in awe of this. It was like a, a musical Disneyland or Disney World. All of these people were there. We sometimes people categorize us or put us all under this umbrella of a Motown, but I think we should be more conscious of the individual artists that, who were there. Like I mentioned, this, we, we have Martha and the Vandellas, we have uh, the Velvetettes, we have Mary Wells, Mar Johnson. We have all these wonderful artists who people have been listening to them your entire lives, a lot of them. I heard someone say we were the soundtrack of, of our lives, especially here in America and around the world. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess the point I'm trying to bring up is that we really were very blessed, as Duke said earlier, to have been not only in that environment, but to be in a place where Barry Gordy did, his dream was that. But we each brought our own dreams. We were the, the Supremes were three little black girls who dared to dream at a time when, you know, we weren't even citizens yet, uh, you know, and, and so we became stars, uh, you know, and when the Civil Rights Bill was passed. Oh, and I have a picture here of us with uh, LBJ, too. Yeah, yeah. This is back. <laughs> so when was that? Tell us, sir. This, this, this actually was in a White House with LBJ and uh, it was 1968. Yeah. Uh, we also endorsed Hubert Humphrey. But I, I don't talk, want to talk too much about what, what we did, but the thing is, is that we were in, in an environment where we were nurtured. We had an etiquette teacher. You mentioned Maurice King, our yeah. musical director, who really was a big, big band leader back in the day. Right. Uh, Charlie Atkins, our choreographer, he actually worked the chilling circuit. He was in the vaudeville. Atkins, Coles and Atkins. Atkins. So yeah. we were surrounded by a many, many wonderful people, talented people. And what they did was they not only nurtured us, but they shared their, because these were people who kind of retired from, there were black people who had retired from show business, but they taught us. I don't think we had that today. Yeah, what no, I let, would let really- Let me explain that. Yeah, you explain, explain something to me, honey. What Barry Gordy did. <laughs> What Barry Gordy did, <laughs> I just wanted to get a word in. <laughs> <laughs> what Barry Gordy actually really did, other than just recording all the artists, <laughs> he was building mm -hmm. artists and making them stars. Sure. Across the street from Studio A, he bought a house and he called that artist development. Right. What he did with artist development, he bought a woman, Maxine Powell, to teach the girls how, how to, to dress, sit, <laughs> talk, eat, all that. Charlie Atkins to teach us how to dance. Yeah. Maurice King and Gil Askey to write arrangements for them. Because these were kids mm -hmm. that had not been out on stage working. And so mm -hmm. somebody had to teach them 
this is the type of, type of clothes maybe you should wear. Mm -hmm. This is the steps you could use with this song that you just had. Mm -hmm. Maurice King would write the arrangements and he would build and build and help create this wonderful movements and wonderful mm -hmm. sounds other than just raw throw them out there on the Challenge, stage with a hit yeah. record that never been out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taught them how to walk on the stage, how to get off, how to do this. <laughs> yeah. Artist development, Artist nobody development. Had, was doing that and nobody's doing it now. Right. So he right. was building right. stars. Yeah. Yeah. And it really paid off, thank it you. Off. That's right. And <laughs> yeah. you know, you mentioned more, uh, our, our person, uh, uh, you mentioned Max, Mrs. Maxine Powell. Yeah. She was one in the artist develop, development department. Yeah. So we would record, and this is when we were still the No Hit Supremes that I yeah. call. And the reason why I call it No, no Hit, Hit Supremes, Supremes right. because we, we were the last people to get a, a hit. Yeah. And I knew, and we thought we were cute. We, you know, we were like really girly, you girly girls. The last shit. Yeah, we were, I mean, we came I'm saying. After you. <laughs> that's okay. We, no, we got to hit the same time, actually. But but anyway, so the Know Your Supremes, I knew that they were talking about us behind our backs, right? Because me, Diane, and Flo, we were really like, we were like cute. And uh, <laughs> so, so I said, they were talking about us behind our back and said, No Hit Supremes. However, Mrs. Powell in the artist development uh, department was the one who really helped us. She taught us, she said, One day, you girls are going to be singing before kings and queens. And we're like, queens, only queens we know are, you know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> right? And so, <laughs> seriously. And, and, <laughs> and so she taught us how to sit, yeah. you know, with your knees together and, and how to sit like here and how to get in and out of limousines. Now, we didn't know anything about limousines unless you died, right? That's the only kind of, we're talking, like you said, this was back in 19, the early, the mid 60s, the early 60s. So we, we didn't ride in limousines. We just saw them when, you know, the funeral home. But anyway, she taught us one day how to get in and out of the limousine. May I d demonstrate for you? Okay, so when you're approaching the limo, and you know, imagine the paparazzi, they're coming. So we're coming, we're coming like this. So the way you get, you slide in like this, and you do like this, and then you do like this. So, okay, now at the end of the day, after we have gone to her class and the whole bit, she went to get in her car, and here she did, she was kind of a little, you know, had a little, so she get in. <laughs> <laughs> And we were standing up there, and we were and we were laughing at her. So, so she said, "See, that's what I'm talking about." But it all came true in our lives later on, <laughs> because you know we knew then once when we started hanging out with Princess Christina in Sweden, uh, England, we did a command performance with uh, Prince Charles, the Queen Mother. Yeah. We knew how to yeah. act and what to do, yeah. but it was because Motown had right. that artist development. You know, I. I, one time I interviewed Barry and I asked him, I said, why did you, you do call this? Him Barry, so no, call Mr. Him Gordy. Gordy. It was Mr. Gordy. It was Mr. <laughs> Gordy. Him, <laughs> to his face. Years, I still call no, him Mr. Gordy. Mr. Gordy. <laughs> but I'm sorry. He said <laughs> one of the reasons was to represent Motown, of course, in its most favorable light, but also because it was the height of the civil rights yes. era, that you were also representing the black race as yeah. well. And you guys were out on the road and you went down south and you went to places where things were still pretty rough at the time. Yeah. Are there any instances where you could do uh, or you saw the music acting as the great unifying force between mm -hmm. black and white? Oh, there was there was quite a few yeah, times. Yeah. You, I know yeah. you remember quite a yeah. few. Well, the, the, Claudette because and I were I on the same tour one thing yeah. when that happened. Is that when you're talking about uh, how to get in a car or any of the other things that mm -hmm. were to give you grace and grace charm and, and charm, all? Yes. We, the miracles, didn't have that in the beginning because it hadn't started yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Artist development hadn't begun. And so our very first date at the Apollo Theater, we went on stage and we thought we had this routine together. <laughs> three, you know, three from stage right, two from stage left, and it said, ladies and gentlemen, the miracles. We got there, got to the center of the stage and clapped, stopped the music and we clapped for the next 12 hours. That was our routine. And we oh. thought we were going. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. the gentleman called Mr. Gordy and said he wanted his money back. No. <laughs> <laughs> and and one, of, one of now, the, 
now that we're talking about maybe coming up to the near near present yeah motown records in which we all i think i can speak for all the artists one of the greatest things that we felt about the music after we all had some hits is that it was a small part of the civil rights movement yeah. Yeah. at that time whites start buying our records mm -hmm. what that had never bought re black records before you know you could while martin king was slowly marching down the street our music was seeping out of their houses out of the yeah. kitchens out of their basements out of and then they see us on tv and it was like oh wow they they look okay yeah, they're right. great yeah uh oh, and, and i think yeah. mm -hmm. i'm sorry I <laughs> that's to okay i got a story but her, yeah. yeah and i think it <laughs> It kind of it kind of just softened the blow yeah. of the civil rights movement. So we're all yeah. very proud that we were a small part of that. And now for the future, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you. <laughs> and, and for the future, you know, I've been thinking, you know, this, this world is it's kind of in an uproar, and music is the universal language. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Even, you know, we've been to places where people can't speak English, they sang the shit out of them songs. Yeah. Excuse me. It's <laughs> true. It's the universal language. It is. So, it is. so we went to Universal just a few weeks ago, I'm an attorney and myself, and said yeah. we want to do an album. Now, we ain't recorded an album in maybe 40 years. They said, what kind of album? I said, the concept is an album that will bring people together. You know, that would show them through song, which is the universal language, mm -hmm. that with love, and if the words are lovely enough, people will listen and it might mm -hmm. ease that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's the part that we're going to play yeah. in trying to bring this yes. world back together mm -hmm. and well, bring it back to peace and love. Well, I, yeah, I'm just going to tell you about one of our stories that happened with us. We were down south on tour. Yeah. And as we, you know, they would divide the audiences, oh, yeah. uh, put a rope down the center if mm -hmm. it was that type of venue. If not, uh, whites would be uh, downstairs and blacks would be upstairs. Correct. And, or it would be right. the other way where they'd put a rope down the middle. The middle. Mm -hmm. Blacks on one side, whites on the other. Well, for one of our dates, Smokey said, we are not playing this date unless they take their rope down because people need to come together and enjoy this music. Because often the young people would tell us, we have to sneak and play your records because our parents don't want us right. playing that music, that type of music. So it began, you know, it was a slow start for what was happening with um, the people and the music. But finally it got to a part that on that particular day, they moved the rope because the police officers would be there with uh, billy clubs. Yeah. And if you, you know, changed or went over to the other side and you weren't of that color, he would hit you, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. of course, nobody wanted to do that. But what happened is because Smokey said we're not going to play that date and they took the ropes away, that was the time where people were one, once again or once starting uh, to come together and one of the things of coming together they started dancing with each other mm -hmm. they started laughing and just having a great time and it was kind of like the start of people knowing that it doesn't matter about the color of your skin or your nationality or any of those things that people put into place that are supposed to make a difference mm -hmm. music is such a healer and it combines so that people can enjoy mm -hmm. the music and not care about, you know, what you look like or what the color of your skin is yeah. or anything mm -hmm. else. They just want to have a good yeah. time. Yeah. And can as a you result, dance? <laughs> <laughs> many times they couldn't. Well, we had. <laughs> 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 well, you, you know, the other day, the young man, Brian Stevenson, yeah. I think, spoke, yeah. and he was yeah. one, he was absolutely wonderful, but he told a story that happened to him, he and his sister, and I, I couldn't wait to talk to him when he got backstage, yeah. because I said the same thing happened to us. Now, I'll tell you the story briefly, if, if I can. I really, Okay. Anyway, so, <laughs> we were on a uh, Motown Review tour, 
uh, motor review tour, and uh, we went through the South, and so I think we had a day off, and everyone said, okay, we're gonna stop at this motel and just kind of cool out. So we pull up to the motel on this raggedy bus, and uh, so we, someone said, that's a swimming pool out there, and we're like, really? So everyone ran up to their rooms, took put on their suit, and then ran down to the pool and, and jumped into the pool, right? And all the white people jumped out. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm serious. Every, all the white people jumped out, all the black people jumped in who was on the bus with us, of course. And uh, so then there was a little transistor already on the side here, and Stevie Wonder was on the tour, too. And, and I remember that they were playing his record on the radio. And one of the people on the side said, that looks like that. Like, oh. They jumped back in the pool. <laughs> And we, and, we, and we partied the rest of the day together. So as Claudette was saying, music is sort of like an ambassador, and it has brought people together. I know people have listened to the music a lot of times, and they didn't even like black people, but the music was soulful, you know? It really, I'm, I'm serious, so the music is something that, uh, I'm very proud to have been, that at the age of 13, I started singing. So I've been singing all my life, and I'm so proud that I found uh, something that makes me happy, and to see the smiles on people's faces. We're in a business where we make people smile, but I make people smile because I'm just having fun myself. So I think it's infectious, you know? I don't wanna go to a party where I'm the only one having fun. And I think music is kind of like yeah, that. We've yeah. been very yeah, blessed very to blessed have. And may I say Absolutely. something else? This is something I really have to talk, got to talk about. It, I'm so, Anyway, I should have been a politician, I tell you. But anyway, so Rick Perry actually uh, helped me pass a piece of legislation here in Texas. Uh, and it was called the Truth in Music Act. Now, here recently we have another one where the, the, the artists who recorded before 1972 were not paid when our music was played on the radio, digital radio. And so now we have had this bill passed, the Modernization Act, right, that right. has just been passed, which I was a part of. Huh? Which I was a part and of. And you were part of too. Yeah. And a lot of people. But, but uh, wait, guess what? It was passed 100% in the, in in the, the House, house mm -hmm. and 100% yeah. in the exactly. Senate. Exactly. Yeah. So we're very and, proud of that. And, and that, was a, that right? was a law that we had lived with since. Mm -hmm. One, 1909. So, yeah. yes. We have been for years trying to get that broken. So we got it And passed. we finally got it done. Yeah, done. So I'm very, I want to say I'm very yeah. happy that now a lot of our artists who just, who passed will not receive this, unfortunately. But their estates will. Their estates will, but I'm saying, if, I'd rather have something in my estate. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just only wanted to bring that up because you see a lot of people were not aware that that was going on. They thought every time you hear our music that we're being paid, it's not true. And the unfortunate part is that when the bill was passed by Trump, no, I'm sorry, but anyway, guess it was the same day that what's the guy's name, the rap guy, um, uh, uh, Kanye, yeah, Kanye West was on. So we, that was the day that this bill was passed. Oh, okay. So you guys didn't hear about it, but anyway, we still will get paid, okay? <laughs> And, and of course, it's mostly for the next generation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know. No, no, we get paid. Are you kidding? I'm getting paid. We're getting back. We're getting back. I'm trying to be humble, baby. Don't be <laughs> humble. <laughs> hey, look. <laughs> we, no. It's not, look, here's here's what here's here's what I think. I think it's time for us to stop being humble. We worked hard for it. We went through That's a right. lot of things. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I know I you did. Hard. You know you know I did. I, I know you did. Hard. So I I'm saying, hard. I, I, thank we God. would go to Washington, mm -hmm. and they would have some lobbyists go with us to talk to the representatives in the Senate. It got so that we were so honest and real with it, yeah. the lobbyists would take the back seat and say, come on, go do yeah, you, you just, just go ahead and yeah. start talking. <laughs> right, right. And, and they, because it was fair, yes. and we come from the heart, and they just kept right. nodding their head and say, okay, I'm going I'm to vote for that. Blah, 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 blah. So we fought yeah. hard for that. Uh, I would just wanted to let the audience know that when they're talking about, or we are talking about the hard work that took place and how we kept enduring mm -hmm. and continued because we love music so much. But there were many times that we were shot at. In fact, the other day, I asked Duke, I said, did Bobby ever tell you that one of, on one of our road trips, we turned around and most of the guys were asleep except for the driver. And Bobby and I turned around and there was this guy hanging from a tree. 
And that is something that you never, ever Definitely. forget. That yeah. image goes with you forever. Yeah. And it's like you just don't understand, you know, because we were young and teenagers yeah. and we're wondering why are people treating each other in this manner? Because probably the guy hadn't done anything other than be black. Yeah. And so it's like I'm hoping, I'm also praying that one day that we will all come together and just really appreciate people just as being people and from the bottom of your heart that you'll extend yourself to know that loving another person mm -hmm. is really a good thing mm -hmm. yeah. you know it has nothing to do with what your career is it has nothing to do with the color of your skin or something just the fact that you are a human being yeah. and if you did not know what color a person is I'm sure that Stevie has some wonderful times Stevie. because yeah. he's not looking at people yeah. mm -hmm. by the way they look. He's mm -hmm. looking at them. He feels their heart. And yes. that's a great yes. thing. Wonderful. Absolutely. It's wonderful. Yeah. We're just about out of time. I want to oh, okay. ask one last question and give you a second to think about it. Because if, as we get toward the end here of the 60th anniversary. By the way, um, the museum, of course, will feature this exhibit. I hope you have a chance to go down and, and see it because some of these stories are elaborated. There are other stories, great stage costumes. Thanks to all of them and many others. Uh, this exhibit came together because without the cooperation of the artists of Motown, this could never have happened. I want you to think about one song from each of your catalog that if you had to pick one song to best represent your career in the music that you made, the one that people, that you want people to remember you by, off the top of your head, what song would that be and why? Ooh. Well, I've got, you know, the, the, we, we are very fortunate because we all have some really great songs we can Lots pick from. Them. Well, I'm, I'm gonna pick one that says how we actually really feel. Reach out, I'll there be there. Yeah. That's a good that one. means we'll be there great. to help. Uh, We'll be there to help, to give yeah. out, to do whatever we can, because we are on, believe it or not, our songs are on a love mission, I'm which we love. are, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And reach out and I'll be there, I think. Great. That's a perfect. great choice, yeah. great Thank choice. I, I don't know if I can pick one, having three biological children and the 11 grandchildren. I don't know if I can pick one song, mm -hmm. because they're all, as Du said, they're all about love. I, you can't hurry love. Yeah, you you love. know, it's yeah. all about love. And that, I, I do need to say that Motown back in the day, we sang about love. And if I can just say that love is the answer to everything. And if I can leave anything to this earth, yeah. I'd like to leave my essence of love. And so if I have to pick a song, <laughs> Life's been good to me. Oh no, I don't know. I can't pick a song. Anyway, it's all about love. <laughs> it's hard to pick one something, me, honey. Got so uh, much going on. As a member of the Miracles, I have to also, one of the things that I was thinking about as everyone was talking, and I'd be remiss to not mention Bobby Rogers, Ronnie White, Pete Moore, along with Smokey who really worked together. And those guys co-wrote many of the songs that you know that you probably just think of Smokey as being the only writer. But we had some extremely yeah, talented guys. And of course, Marv Tarplin, the guitarist that she says we stole from them. <laughs> they did. And, uh, but I think that that song, even though Smokey wrote a lot of love yeah. songs, because yeah. he's a lovable guy. And one of the songs for me personally as a member of the Miracles would be, and also his wife at the time, would be More Love. And that song was written especially for me because at the time I was going through some difficult times with uh, pregnancies. I had a total, unfortunately, of eight miscarriages and uh, they were long term, uh, you know, five and a half, six, six and a half months. And um, it was very, very hurting. And the song was written as a reminder of the love that he had for me. So that song was especially for me personally. 
but I'm sure that a lot of people could really relate to it as well. At least I hope so. Yeah, right. But oh, I'm sorry. go ahead. I was just going to say that as she was saying about love, there's no feeling that I can think of that's better than love yeah. or that can really heal your heart. Things that you're going through, be it your health issues, because they have discovered that as a child, if a child is given touching, feeling, holding, and love, that they grow much faster, much healthier. And so I think that that's something that we, as now grown up adults, should think about. You yeah. know, reach out your hand sometimes and just tell somebody that you love them. Right. And just, mm -hmm. you know, t sometimes people are going through things and you might think, that, child, that person is really being mean. Sometimes it's something that's going on in their life. And if somebody could just say, I love you, I love you. Yeah. that would mean the world yeah. to that individual. So mm -hmm. when you can, right. just always remember, to, especially for yeah. your family members and others, let somebody know that you care mm -hmm. and that you actually really love them. Yeah. It will mean, you just have no idea what that can mean yeah. to another individual. Mm -hmm. I want to say one last yeah. thing <laughs> from yeah. me. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. stop. Yeah. <laughs> In the name then, of love. Th there you go. That's what I mean. That's my song. I now, a lot of people, <laughs> finally, yeah. a lot of think. people probably wonder why we as artists, we talk about love all the time. But, but listen to this. Every single night, I've been singing professionally for 65 years. Wow. But I want to say, every night I stand on that stage, I look out there, guess what I see? I see love. Mm -hmm. I see love. I see respect. I see a thank you. I see all those wonderful mm -hmm. words. And I've been going through my whole life looking at, at, looking at people with those happy, smiling, smiling. loving faces yeah. given to us. Yeah. So it's only natural that we talk about love because that's what we see yeah. every night yeah. we perform. Yeah. And it's so easy. Some people can say, well, I don't know how you can talk about love, man. You know, it's <laughs> funny shit out here. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's why, because we see it all, yeah, the time, all the time. And it's so easy to talk about it because it exists. And you could be a part of that just by giving of yourself. Like yes. she said, just saying the word love, love. is good enough. Thank Very. You. Mary, bring us home. Did you know Mary, me and Mary was engaged 50 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> We've been in love all our life. We just didn't marry. <laughs> just I, I don't know if I can say any more than what my, my, my friends have said because it's so very true to be able to have something in your life that you love doing and it brings other people happiness. That's a wonderful feeling. It's, it is love. That is what love is. And I just feel so very blessed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Claudette Robinson, Duke Fakir, Mary Wilson, Motown. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Thank you for coming.